Hello, my name is Benjamin Smith. I'm a member of the Anarcho Syndicalist Federation, which is the Australian section of the International Workers Association. This presentation is about the relationship between the form and principles of anarcho syndicalist organisations. The IWA is not a general membership organisation, rather, it is a confederal organisation, which is to say that it is a federation of federations. While this might seem an odd and complex way of organising, there are very good reasons for it, and what I will try to do today is to provide a short introduction to how the values and principles of anarcho-syndicalism relate to the form of the IWA and its member sections. I thought that a convenient place to start this presentation was with this quotation by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon from 1840. It's from a pamphlet called What is Property? and Proudhon's famous answer was that property is theft. This short statement contains a critique of capitalism and the property relations that undergird the wage system which we, as anarchists, want to do away with. However, it is the second part of the quotation that I want to talk about today. Anarchy is order. The circle A symbol the internationally recognisable symbol of anarchism is made up of an A and an O and represents the unity of anarchy and order. And I want to assert very strongly that anarchism does advance a vision of social order. That vision is collectivist rather than individualistic, it is anti-authoritarian and it is preeminently democratic. It is this relationship between anarchism and a vision of a genuinely democratic social order that will form the crux of this presentation. And I'm going to argue that anarcho-syndicalism attempts to put this vision into practice, not just as some utopian dream of a future society, but in the way we organise in the here and now. So anarchism is about establishing a genuinely democratic social order. Anarcho-syndicalism, put very simply, is the anarcho-syndicalist approach to organising unions. One thing I'd like to stress, however, is that anarcho-syndicalist unions are intended to be genuinely popular organisations, meaning that they are open to all workers, not just to anarchists. You do not necessarily need to be an anarchist to join an anarcho-syndicalist organisation. What is important, however, is that we organise and struggle in ways that are consistent with anarchist principles. We are motivated to organise in this way for two very good reasons. Firstly, because we want to make a revolution and create a truly just society. To do this, it is not just enough to talk about destroying capitalism and the state. We need to create organisations that can replace the state. The state is a hierarchical and bureaucratic apparatus of power that exists over and separate to the people it governs. To create institutions that have a direct democratic character and to extend direct democracy to every institution of society, this is the destruction of the state. And I cannot stress this point strongly enough. Anarchism is not just about negation, negating power and destroying the state. We have a social vision with a truly positive content and that content is demonstrated by anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist federation. The other reason for organising in this way is that we believe that anarcho-syndicalist sections, through promoting direct democratic collective self-management and bottom-up organising, is more effective in gaining real wins against the bosses today. So what I want to talk about is this method of organising and how the principles of association and organisation cascade out from the fundamental values of anarchism and socialism. This slide maps out the key concepts of anarchism. Basically, if you can understand the relationship between the ideas set out here, you will have a sound grasp of how anarcho-syndicalism works, at least in terms of its organisation. I'm going to keep returning to this slide, working slowly from top to bottom. I'll start by briefly explaining the top two rows, and then we will come back to fill in the rest of the picture. So here are the top two rows of the previous slide, 
and beneath it we have the red and black flag of anarcho-syndicalism. The flag itself is a very good starting point for this discussion because the two colours represent the two sets of values listed above it. Firstly, the red, as everyone knows, is the colour of socialism. It's a traditional colour of defiance and became associated with the socialist tradition during the 19th century. It represents the top three values, liberty, equality and fraternity, or better still, solidarity. So why not represent these as the red, white and blue of the French tricolour flag? Well, for the very good reason that solidarity represents the missing value in the bourgeois social order. Liberalism claims to stand for freedom and equality, but it conceives of these in purely formal terms. They are presently not made real, not made concrete, and require the value of solidarity to make them so. This is the aim of socialism, which, as a social movement, emerged out of the still unfinished business of the French Revolution. So the red here stands for the concrete realisation of these three values listed at the top. Yet anarchists do not just want to create socialism. They desire libertarian socialism. The black half of the flag represents the specifically anarchist values of direct action, free association and mutual aid. These three values, these specifically anarchist values, are not only types of activity, they represent transformed versions of the top three values, the values of socialism made manifest through action. While I don't have time to talk about each of them, it is worthwhile commenting on what direct means in direct action. Direct here means unmediated, but it also stands for spontaneity but not spontaneity in the sense of just making things up on the spur of the moment or without much thought. Rather, it means spontaneity in the sense of coming out of the resources of the self, like when we talk about something which demonstrates spontaneous movement, in that it is able to move itself without external compulsion. This idea of spontaneity is linked with the concept of autonomy, which I'll add here to the top of the slide in blue typeface above liberty and freedom. I like the word autonomy when discussing these things more than the concepts of liberty and freedom, which are more abstract and into which people tend to project and overlay different interpretations. The concept of autonomy is more concrete and, I think, more useful. It comes to us from the ancient Greek and combines the words auto meaning self and nomos meaning law and it denotes the act of giving the law to oneself. What I like about it is that it implies a deliberate act. Again, it is not spontaneous in terms of being unreflective and spur of the moment, but is spontaneous in that it arises out of the resources of the self. However, the real reason I'd like to introduce the term autonomy here is that it has both individual and collective aspects. And it is this idea, the idea that autonomy can be both individual and collective, that takes us one step further on our path toward understanding anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist forms of organisation, because the collective aspect of autonomy is democracy. If a decision-making process affects more than one person, our individual autonomy can only be affirmed by and expressed through active participation in collective decision-making. Participation is the critical concept here. Collective autonomy requires participating directly in deliberating on the issues of the day, rather than voting for representatives that would deliberate in your absence. For this reason, the type of democracy I'm referring to is direct democracy. But you will notice that I've put the word direct in brackets. I've done this because I don't really like the common distinction people make between direct democracy and representative democracy. I don't like it because it's a false distinction. Representative democracy is not actually a form of democracy. Democracy is where the people, the demos, have a direct grasp on power. Kratos in demokratos means precisely this, to grasp, and to have a grasp means to be present. If a smaller class of representatives 
hold deliberative power in the absence of the demos, whom they are supposed to represent, then the people are actually absent from the picture, and we can no longer speak of democracy in this situation. What goes on in state parliaments is ruled by the few, or what the Greeks called oligarchy, oligos meaning few, and arche meaning rule, but which is taken from the word origin in the sense that a ruler is the origin of the laws. So I don't like qualifying democracy as direct or otherwise, because direct democracy is democracy. It is the only form of democracy. And what is called representative democracy is actually a form of oligarchy, which is the opposite of democracy. But democracy, direct democracy, isn't necessarily a straightforward thing. I don't want to suggest that democracy is always easy. Democracy is a form of politics. It therefore involves agon and contest, and it often involves compromise, and, of course, you, if you can't convince other people of your arguments or point of view, you're not going to get what you want. This is no surprise to anyone, and so, while, as an anarchist, democracy, direct democracy, is something to which I am fully committed, it is important to understand it fully, and be realistic about it. Part of being realistic about democracy is to acknowledge its limits. The limits of direct democratic organisation are twofold. The first is a problem of scope, and the second is a problem of size. Firstly, what I mean by a problem of democracy's scope is really a question about efficiency and the number of questions a democratic assembly can decide upon in any set period of time. Regardless of who it is, no collective can decide on everything, nor would it be beneficial or useful for it to do so. There is always a need to develop an understanding of what issues are common and require collective deliberation, and what should be left up to individual choice. Ultimately, this means coming to an understanding about where to place the boundary between the private sphere and the public sphere. Even then, the need to respond in a timely manner to events in a changing world may mean it is not always possible to assemble everyone in the same place at the same time. Plus, let's face it, meetings are often boring, and while they are important, we don't want to spend all our lives in meetings. The other problem is size, in that there are physical limits to how many people can assemble in the same place at the same time before a meeting becomes unmanageable. Of course, there are organisational and technological responses that can assist in tackling this problem, but in the end they merely push the size of participants up without actually solving the underlying problem, which persists nonetheless. Luckily, anarchists do have answers to these problems. Anarchism's answer to the problems of scope and size that democracy faces involve these two concepts, delegation and federation. Delegation means entrusting some decision-making power to a member of your group, usually for a specific project or responsibility, and it solves the issue of how much of the group's time and attention needs to be spent on detail and minor decisions. Essentially, it creates efficiency through division of labour. Federation solves the problem of wider coordination through the practice of free association between groups on the basis of affinity or need, but in a way that formalises these relationships under conditions of mutual reciprocity. Together, federal organisation and the sending of delegates to periodically held federal congresses allows for coordination to extend beyond the local level. However, it is here that we risk running into a problem. Without being very specific about what we mean by federation and delegation, we risk recreating the same centralist and authoritarian structures that anarchism is intended to avoid, whereby elected officials consolidate themselves in positions of power and the federal assembly becomes a ruling clique. We therefore need two further sets of principles that qualify how delegation and federation can work without abandoning our libertarian ideas. Let's start with the idea of delegation. Traditionally, anarchists have solved the problem of delegation by subjecting it to three principles – rotation, limited mandate, 
and immediate recall. Rotation of delegates and office bearers does not just mean limiting the time an individual can act in a certain role in order to prevent any personal group from entrenching themselves in positions of personal power at the expense of their comrades. It also relates to how delegates are selected. While it is possible to seek nominations and to vote, and this does sometimes happen, this is generally avoided, especially at the local level. Instead, we simply take it in turns, so that, over time, the responsibility for important jobs gets shared around. What it also means is that it is necessary for people with skills and experience to teach their comrades what is required and how to do it, and to help build their confidence that they too can act as a delegate, especially when it comes to representing the group at Congress. It is very important for more experienced members to share their knowledge because sooner or later your comrades are going to be representing you. We see this as part of cultivating active participation within the group and this is also a mode of direct action. Limited mandate requires that the responsibilities associated with particular roles are defined by the group and that they have limits that are agreed by the group. Sometimes this can be difficult, especially if contingencies arise which have not been discussed and agreed on by the group. Of course, experience can help in anticipating what issues mandated delegates might encounter in their roles, but again, this experience should inform the group's discussions about what the mandate entails. It is not always necessary that the most experienced people should always be the delegates. Immediate recall simply means that delegates are always accountable to their groups and the group has the power to countermand decisions made by a delegate should the delegate exceed his mandate and, indeed, replace him immediately should they lack confidence the delegate is performing his mandated role diligently. So that is how delegation works within anarchist organisations. But we are not going to be able to create a libertarian society if we can't work together on a wider basis, and for that we need federation. Federation is in many ways the crowning principle of anarchist organisation. In fact, at the time of the first International Working Men's Association, during the 1860s and 1870s, those whom we would today think of as anarchists were known simply as federalists. They didn't begin to become known as anarchists for another ten years or so. Federalism is premised on the idea that sovereignty cannot be separated from local assemblies. While free association into federations facilitates communication, cooperation and coordination, responsibility for decision making always stays with local assemblies. This is what is meant by bottom-up organising. While proposals for initiatives might be put forward in the agenda for Federal Congress, these proposals originate at the local level, and after the agenda is circulated, are debated at the local level, with the votes of member sections, not of individuals, being communicated and tallied at Congress. To allow time for this to occur, the call for items and the circulation for agendas for regional and national congresses needs to allow time for debate to take place and the mandates that delegates will bring to Congress to be formed. For this reason, the agenda of the ASF's biannual Congress is finalised and circulated three months ahead of our Congress. And of course, the IWA is much larger and the agenda for its Congress, which takes place every three years, is circulated six months beforehand. I've also listed local ratification of federal processes, which seems to be cut off the bottom of this slide, and for which I apologise. The decisions of federal Congress are binding upon member sections, but this also needs to be balanced against the idea of local sovereignty. This seems to be a contradiction. What I would say to this is that the two principles, local sovereignty and being bound by federal commitments, needs to find a balance. The solidarity and cooperation that federation requires starts to break down if member sections actively go against those decisions made at Congress that they disagree with. For this reason, 
while member sections need to read the minutes and receive report backs from their delegates before ratifying them, what they are ratifying is that the procedures of Congress were conducted in a matter that is right and proper, consistent with the federal statutes, which is to say that the process was correct. Delegation and federation are two principles that need to be thought of as acting together at the same time. An example of this is that the IWA has no permanent secretariat separate from its sections. Rather, the responsibilities of the secretariat are rotated between sections that are capable of taking on the responsibility. Also, in anarcho-syndicalist organisations, the secretariat is not itself a decision-making body. Its primary responsibility is to ensure official lines of communication between the member sections are facilitated in an open and transparent manner. It might also be delegated with certain responsibilities for coordinating initiatives that require ongoing cooperation between member sections, but its primary role is to act as a point through which all official, properly mandated communications are relayed back out to member sections. While at first glance this might seem overly bureaucratic, actually it's extremely important because federation requires being able to know what communications between member sections are subject to proper mandates. As well as full collective participation in decision making, federation requires this sort of function to ensure that its activities remain transparent to everyone. This, I think, is the great benefit of Federation as an organisational principle. We do all sorts of things in our daily lives that involve communicating, cooperating and organising with other people. Inevitably, when we do this we create networks which may be formal or informal. It is unavoidable and it comes to be facilitated and it's come to be facilitated by internet based technologies. We use this stuff every day, and I meet lots of people, including some anarchists, who think that formalising their political relationships into federated structures isn't useful, and may even be redundant in this day and age. I think that they are seriously mistaken. Networks are ubiquitous. They arise spontaneously, and yes, they are useful, but they are not transparent. The market is an example. The reason why capitalism is such a fucked up situation. Why the sort of parasitic bullshit that capitalism facilitates is able to occur, and why capitalism is prone to the crises that afflict it, is due to the fact that the market is a complex network and will never be transparent to itself. Federation is a mode of organising that allows for extended participation on the basis of equality, and this equality is assured by structures that guarantee its transparency to all who participate in them. A genuine democracy that extends beyond the local level cannot take any other form. That is why, whenever political, this, that is why, whatever other political militancy we are engaged in. We cannot create a path to revolution without participating in and through practicing being a part of federal modes of organizing. And so there you have it. The system of principles, or at least how I understand the system of principles, that underpin anarchism as a political system and therefore also anarcho-syndicalist forms of union organization. Federation, delegation and direct democracy. Thank you.